The combination of crypto and AI has been getting a lot of buzz recently. According to Van Eck, crypto AI revenues are projected to reach $10.2 billion by 2030. Do you agree with that projection? Uh, such a great question to kick it off. I, I think, and I was talking to the team at Vanek about this, uh, I think that's on the low end of where we might end up. If, uh, if I remember correctly from that report, they were projecting something like $6 trillion in AI-driven productivity uh, over by, by 2030. And if decentralized AI serves as the backbone for everything that needs to get built on top with AI, I believe those numbers are the very low end of the spectrum in terms of what we might expect. But we're starting to see some really cool tech and infrastructure getting built. So we're expecting to see that, uh, you know, we'll expect to see that play out really well. Interesting. So last month, OKX Ventures released a report about the potential of crypto and AI. And the report says the merging of the two technologies is giving rise to new applications and innovations encompassing areas like model training, AI agents, metaverse, gaming and robots as a service. In a nutshell, what is your outlook for crypto and AI? And do you see a lot of potential tied to the merging of the technologies? Absolutely. Uh, if you look at the progression of AI to date, uh, it's been largely driven by centralized entities, right? So the amount of innovation and horsepower, whether it's access to data, access to talent or access to resources, has been largely controlled by a select few. Uh, on the other hand, we look at decentralized blockchain based networks. We really thrive on certain ethos and principles like decentralization, um, uh, transparency, auditability, et cetera. So as we look forward, while we are starting to build out the infrastructure in a very collaborative manner today, there's just so much that needs to get built. If you look at some just like pointed use cases today, right? Data provenance. Talia, you and I are having this conversation. At some point, this data might get used to train a model. How does CNBC, how do we get credit for something like that? Or we look at training of models for medical purposes, for legal purposes, or for finance. Those can't be trained on public data. They need to be trained on private. They need to be trained on private data. And we have primitives for things like this in the world of blockchain, like fully homomorphic encryption. We have zero knowledge for attestation of proofs, etc. So uh, I'll pause there. But I, I'm really bullish on where we can take all the work that's been done in the world of blockchain primitives and really putting that to work when it comes to AI. So I recently interviewed the chief scientist at Chainlink Labs, who argued that the often touted uses for bringing AI and blockchain together aren't actually all that useful. Some of what he calls misleading narratives include that blockchain can combat misinformation caused by generative AI and that blockchain can bring privacy to AI. Do you think these narratives can be considered misleading? Are there any concerns you have tied to the convergence of AI and crypto? Yeah, I, I look at it as a, a glass half full opportunity, right? I think with the sort of the blast radius of what we're encountering today, uh, it doesn't feel particularly good. Whereas the kind of primitives we have in the world of blockchain actually can serve legitimate use cases, right? We have seen uh, situations where there have been elections held in various countries, and we have been able to use certain primitives like zero knowledge to be able to attest to the source of certain media types and ensuring that those actually came from the sources that they were that they truly actually came from. How do we put these to work at scale, right? So I would say the technology is there and it is really up to us to put these to work now and bring them to the masses. So while it's completely fair to be questioning these principles, uh, I think what is incumbent upon us now is to build out these products and put them to work because you know we've been building them out for quite some time now. So I, I definitely appreciate the skepticism, but I'm confident that the technology is going to play out as we hope it will. And realistically speaking, how long do you think that could potentially take? Uh, you know, we're seeing, we're starting to see shoots of this emerge today. Uh, it, it is, you know, one of those adoption curves that we're sort of in, this, in, the, in the thick of right now. 
you know, if you look at sort of like how venture capital evolves sometimes, right, we tend to place bets on where we think that the puck is going, where technology will be in a few years. And that is, you know, we're in sort of like that infrastructure layer of, of making sure that there's some primitives, we need to put them to work for AI. And then we start to see the usage start to show up here when certain use cases come up. I'll talk about a very specific example. We've had this concept of decentralized compute networks for, for several years now. Akash Network is one of these examples. But uh, if you look at where the pressing need sort of came up with Akash today, it was with training of these models, right? We, training models is a very expensive compute intensive task, whereas we have decentralized blockchain based networks that I can actually deliver the same level of efficacy at you know, anywhere from a fourth uh, to, uh, you know, four to a sixth of the cost that would, would be for centralized servers. So uh, maybe a more succinct and, and uh, to simply put this, I would say, the technology has been there. What's starting to show now is like the, the, the painkiller use case and how these start to come together. So we're starting to see those come together today. And as more of these start to come up, we'll start to see the technology adoption start to pick up. But as, as, uh, as a venture capitalist, we're placing those bets on where the technology we think is going to go in the next few years, but also really partnering with people who are truly living and embodying that future today. Now, you are a light speed venture partner and, of course, the founder of Canonical Crypto, an early stage fund investing in crypto and Web3 infrastructure. So I'm curious to get your take on what crypto VC trends have been gaining traction and how much of the VC interest is focused on the convergence of AI and blockchain technology. Yeah, uh, I have been exclusively focused on this intersection because I feel this technology is uh, AI is is one of those technologies that you know we're not going to be we're going to be Italia you and I in two years for having this conversation we're still going to be talking about this and I I, I think it is it's far too promising and important for for there not to be focused on it so that's been my area of focus but there's just so much so much more that needs to get built you know obviously uh, with the, the kind of tailwinds that are happening with ETFs. With, with Solana hitting certain high, high thresholds lately, with various upgrades happening in the world of Ethereum, there's a lot of infrastructure that's getting built in and around this. But we're also starting to see certain consumer trends pick up. Farcaster, for example, which is a Web3 native social networking platform, is having a moment. They're having record usage on their platform. Uh, pr proud to have been an investor from the earliest days there. Um, but we're starting to see shoots like this emerge, whether it's social, whether it's gaming, or true manifestations of finance coming to life. Uh, you know, we're starting to see some companies, you know, now that scalability, we feel like we've hit that point where we can reliably use blockchain networks for payments. We're starting to see TradFi and, and blockchain-based finance come together. So these are some interesting areas we're starting to see developments and investments go into infrastructure, middleware developer tooling, and at the very top of the stack, finance, gaming, social, we're starting to see investments flow there as well. So in a nutshell, what's your investment outlook for crypto? What are some of the hottest sectors? You touched on some, but what else are you paying attention to? Uh, you know, for me, it's still, it's still about the basics. You know, I grew up building and evangelizing developer infrastructure. And to me, a signal uh, that is very promising for any technology is when developers flock to it. That's when you know that you're starting to build something that needs to get, that, that starts to compound in terms of what it can offer to the world, right? So we saw this initially with cloud-based platforms like AWS and Azure. We start to see another wave happen with mobile, became another platform. And I think with AI now, this is truly another platform. Blockchain, again, two very loaded heavyweight platforms that are coming together. So to me, you know, to peel another layer of this or to, to you know, descend uh, this plane a little bit more, I'd say, you know, I would love to see more focus on, you know, privacy preserving machine learning concepts using blockchain primitives. I think data provenance is a huge issue. It continues to be a problem today. How do we solve for that? How do we fight things like disinformation, misinformation, or deep fakes that are emanating? Um, but in a nutshell, I would say we have such beautiful technology that, that needs to be put to work for some of the things we're seeing out there today. And I'm really excited about that and, and really starting to put our, our rails to work in a credible way. So are you noticing there's more interest in crypto now that Bitcoin hit a new all-time high above $73,000 in recent weeks and spot Bitcoin ETFs started trading here in the U.S.? Have you seen a shift in sentiment from investors? That, that is definitely provided for 
awesome tailwinds for activity from an investment perspective coming back in, which is also closely tied to developer activity, founders getting back into the fray and wanting to build here as well. So absolutely, that's that's been uh, you know that's been a huge uh, proponent for us. Um, on the flip side, I, I was reflecting on this. Uh, you know, I uh, in my career. You know, usually we try to make bets that are several years out, and the, the the pros and cons of operating crypto are that sometimes we anchor a lot on price, and you know when this tends to happen, you know there's like in, in ebbs and flows that happen to the price, and that's related to our investment trends as well. But over a long enough time horizon, right? Again, we're having this conversation five, ten years out. These small episodic moments will will feel like such small blips relative to how much the price will have appreciated, and how grateful uh, I think we'll all be that uh, we were able. Able to do some incredible things on these, you know, what feel like nascent platforms today. So it is, uh, while a lot of it is predicated on price today over a long enough time frame, as more developers and more founders come in, we're going to see some really cool tech being built, which is really going to work for us in the future. Now, in a recent report from JP Morgan, the bank's global market strategy team argued that the price of Bitcoin will slide following this halving, citing overbought conditions, prices still well above the bank's comparison to gold and subdued venture capital funding. New research from Deutsche Bank also says not to expect the post having Bitcoin rally. So do you agree? What's your take on what we can expect? Yeah, you know, it's, I think as uh, someone uh, said, uh, you know, history tends to rhyme, but doesn't repeat, right? So if we were to follow that, I'd say it to be completely candid. I, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I feel like, uh, you know, if we were to reflect back on this post having, you know, there's obviously three very incredible scenarios. The price could go up, it could stay flat, it could go down. But I, I'm more interested in what I think is going to happen in the next 9, 12, 24 months where, uh, again, the price is invariably, you know, there may be some imminent pressure on supply post having, but over a long enough time frame, as ETF flows continue to grow, and I know you captured this really well, Talia, in a previous report as well, I think we're looking at what, 12 billion in inflows now, and that's just gonna to continue to grow as, as mass adoption starts to happen. Over a long enough time frame, I believe that we are, you know, the, the price action is going to be favorable for, for all of us. So uh, this is kind of a non-answer to your question and some somewhat tongue in cheek, but I'm trying to not pay attention to the to the micro, but pay more attention to the macro and all the multimodal factors that could implement, that could impact price, whether it's it's beyond crypto, obviously there's other factors, whether it's wars or, or various other catastrophes that could cause these ebbs and flows, but in, but in a broad enough time frame. Uh, you know, price will will appreciate as we've seen. You know, I first started mining Bitcoin back in 2012, and here here we are. You know, like almost 12 years later, how much the price has appreciated? I would never have been able to forecast that. But uh, as we look forward, I think we're going to start to see more price appreciation start to happen. And it certainly will be very interesting to see if that does in fact happen. Anand Iyer, founder of Canonical Crypto, thank you very much for joining us and for that comprehensive insight. Thank you so much.